listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. You can always send me your emails, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our main website, www.exxonradio.com. My guest this hour is a good friend of the Exxon. Scott Marlowe is his name, and... Uh, we're really happy to have Scott back on the show. We're going to be talking to Scott about his new book, Squallies. Now, uh, Scott is proclaimed as America's most credible cryptozoologist. He spends much of his time in camas and boots, and uh, he does a lot of lab work at Oxford. Now, he's a fellow of the famed Pangaea Institute and an educational consultant to the American Primate Conservation Alliance. Scott is the first expert in the field to succeed in establishing an ongoing college course in cryptozoology at a state institution of higher learning anywhere in the world. His cryptozoology course hailed as one of the top 10 news stories of 2004 by the cryptozoologist, a well-known insider e-magazine, has won both accolades and awards for its fresh approach and application of forensic science methodologies to the study of enigmatic animals and uh, joining me now is scott marlowe and we're talking to scott this hour about his new book entitled squallies and uh, scott welcome back to the exxon congratulations on your new book squallies thank you very much rob it's great to be here as always scott tell us a little bit about squallies i i had never heard of them before 
Well, it, it, it's an interesting story. Uh, it was first told to me, or these creatures were first explained to me, when I was doing a book signing at uh, the Ripley's Auditorium there in uh, uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Mm-hmm. And uh, a, a guest came up to the signing and started telling me the story, which fascinated me. And uh, this is you know, going back almost 10 years now. And I started doing research on it, trying to get every you know, detail that I possibly could. Right. And uh, the result of what I discovered is squallies, which I decided to do. Uh, and this is the first time I've done anything that's been fictionalized. But the story is fictionalized only from the standpoint that I wasn't there to hear the dialogue. And I made up the dialogue uh, that goes between the characters, although all the characters in the story are real and the events themselves are real. So what do we call this? It, it, it sounds like there is fact as well as fiction, but the fiction is there because the fact can't be collaborated by you as a firsthand Hearing? That's correct. Yeah, gotcha. So it's, it's, it's a fictionalized true story. Fictionalized true story. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd just like to read a little bit of the introduction here. According to University at Alabama psychologist Gordon Gallup, uh, a human-chimp hybrid was successfully endangered, engendered, I'm sorry, and both uh, during experiments by Robert Yerk- Yerkes and his colleagues at the Yerkes Research Center located in Orange Park, Florida in the early 1930s. Uh, Callop claimed uh, he heard the story when he was a young graduate student. So are squallies an experiment that went wrong? That's apparently the case. Uh, now, you know, everybody knows because it was released years ago with the KGB mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, from the KGB that, that Stalin had been experimenting with this in about the same time frame little bit before us we apparently got wind of it and our uh, military started doing the same kind of experimentation and subsequent to us the chinese have done the same for what reason apparently well let's put it this way back in the 1920s and Mm -hmm. 30s the you know the big thing was social darwinism you know we we like to call it eugenics and in fact, many of the eugenics programs, the you know, attempt to create the, quote, master race that Hitler went through, was all eugenics based on things we were doing here in the United States before Germany. Interesting. Uh, it's, been, it's been long forgotten and swept under the rug, but we were pioneers in it under a gentleman by the name of Charles Davenport. All right, listen, you and I have to take a commercial break. Please stand yep. by. Scott, once again, congratulations on Squallies. Exonation, my guest this hour is Scott Marlowe. And uh, he can be found at PangeaInstitute.us. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Scott and I will be back on the other side of the short break. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. 
I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Exonation. Uh, Scott Marlowe is our special guest. Scott is a good friend of the Exxon. And uh, he's got a new book out called Squallies. And uh, if you'd like more information on Scott, visit him online at pangeainstitute.us. Now, Scott, I'm sorry I had to cut you off there for the commercial break, so please continue. Well, the problem with creating a, quote, master race, unquote, is that if you have a population that all leaders, uh, who does all the work? True. Uh, so they started experimenting with uh, with hybridization to create essentially a slave race that would fight wars for them and do other things, which went hands in hand with this uh, with this idea of creating uh, you know a perfect society. And that's pretty much where these experiments, you know, that both Stalin and Mao and, and the United States all started playing around with with human ape hybrids. Is it possible? It's very Planet of the Apes. I mean, it really, yeah. really is. Is it then possible, Scott, that the reports of Bigfoot that we're getting today are actually a result of these experimentations? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that that's true throughout the entire United States mm-hmm. and, or the world. But some of the ones coming out of South Florida likely are, uh, you know, especially when you get reports and they you know, go ahead and look through the databases of, uh, you know, these uh, swamp apes swinging through trees and mm-hmm. things like that. Obviously, that's the chimpanzee behavior, not something that a 400 pound gorilla is going to do. So are, how do we how do we treat them as a species? Do we treat them as humans? Do we treat them as animals? How do Good question, how? and that's probably why they're still kept secret and in this supposed top secret preserve that's down there in the Everglades somewhere. How tall are these uh, these uh, squallies? Uh, from what I understand, a bit taller than a normal chimpanzee, but that that's pretty wide uh, wide range because if you look at the uh, pantroglodyte swine furthy, they're bigger than a gorilla. 
Is there any possible? So, you know, your average yeah. you know, cute chimp or bonobo is not is is about uh, two thirds as tall as a human. So, what do we do with these these squallies that are that are out there? Um, is or is, their progeny? Is there is there any protection in place for them? Well, apparently so. Uh, you know, there's this this facility down there. Uh, in the Everglades, it's apparently taking care of them mm-hmm. and keeping them away from the population. But like any relatively wild creature, they manage to get out, especially an intelligent one. I mean, we've had episodes down here where orangutans have gotten out of their enclosures and done various things uh, in the you know in the neighborhood. We had one at Bush Gardens get out of the cage by unlocking herself, climbing out on the roof, and waving at cars going by on the you know, Bush Boulevard. What kind of research did you do in order to um, to write squallies? Uh, well, besides going down there and interviewing people and and hanging out down in the area where the story took place, mm-hmm. I had to go through I can't tell you how many historical society records uh, you know in Miami, in Naples, all through that particular area. The police department down there looking at the records there newspaper archives i mean it it was on and on and on and on and on until i finally got to the point that i was able to tie it all together and realized what really happened so why would the government keep this secret uh would you really want people to know that they were being subjected and people had been killed by these things that they created would you want them want the public to know that uh, you've been engaging in eugenics mm-hmm. without their knowledge. How do we know they really exist? We don't. You know, I've never actually seen one, but you know, the people that I've spoken to, mm-hmm. as far as I can see, are absolutely violent in their uh, in their uh, their credibility. Okay. And what what's really very frightening about the story is all the facts as I told the story fit. The people are there. You go ahead and do research on everybody I named in there. Right. And you're going to find them. They're there. But the squallies aren't there. Maybe yes, maybe no. But, you know, what's what's harder to believe you know that uh, this gentleman, uh, you know, the central character who gets killed, uh, it was a bootlegger. Yeah, we know that. Did he work for Al Capone? Yeah, we know that. Was he involved in various nefarious things up in Detroit? Yeah, we know that. But did you know? You don't know for a fact where he died. If you look into it, some people say he died in Texas. Some people say that uh, they they fed him to the alligators in the swamps here in Florida because he uh, you know bought liquor from someone other than Capone. Well, I'm not so sure I buy that. Look, when Capone was arrested and incarcerated, Mm -hmm. and uh, when this guy disappeared, they don't jive. All right, but you're talking about Al Capone. We know that Al Capone was a real person. Yes, exactly. Many people. So was Ray Nugent, who they they called, uh, I think it's Gooseneck, was his nickname. Crane Neck, excuse me, Crane Neck. All right, but the question is, you know, the, the squallies seem to be as elusive as Bigfoot. Yeah, absolutely. And expectedly so, since they're protected by the military. Is Bigfoot protected by the military? Uh, I don't speculate, but I wouldn't be surprised. And there are many, many stories that are out there in Bigfoot that say they are. You know, well, you've got still got the people who believe that there, the UFO community believes that there's a government conspiracy and that the extraterrestrials are being cl- uh, protected by the by the military as well. But once again, yeah, and there are definitely Bigfoot researchers out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I, you know, maybe I should put researchers in quotations. Yeah. But uh, there are Bigfoot people out there who absolutely swear that they have been approached when they got too close by MIB, uh, trying to silence them. Do you buy that? I don't know. They've not have never approached me, and if anybody's gotten close, I certainly have. Why is it that people find it necessary to embellish 
the paranormal or any aspect of the paranormal? Well, some people do it for attention. Some people do it because they think they're smarter than everybody else and they mm -hmm. want to prove it. Uh, some people want to get their 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 name in, in uh, or their 15 minutes of fame. Some people want to get on TV. There's any number of reasons. Some people really just want to know the truth and pursue it because that's part of what they want to know. They've seen it, they've had an experience, mm -hmm. and they're trying to explain it to themselves and in their mind. And but, I don't blame them for that. That's why I did it. No, I, I don't blame them at all either. But with all the modern day technology, Scott, you would think by now someone would have taken that elusive picture of Bigfoot. And in this case, Squally's. Not necessarily. And, you know, then again, I mean, we've got some pretty good convincing photography and video of UFOs, but everybody yells hoax. And, of course, one of the easiest ways to hide the truth is disinformation, misinformation, and planting more crapola so the public doesn't take it with anything but a grain of salt. But in the big scheme of things, when it comes to UFOs, how in the name of heaven would you be able to conceal the real existence of UFOs with the modern-day technology that we have? God, if Bill Clinton can't have an affair in the White House without everybody finding out within six months, how are you well, going to... Well, yeah, but the UFO didn't go, or a friend of the UFO person or the ET didn't go to the press and tell them about it either. Well, that's just it. Now, you've got all these people who are hacking into government data banks. If this information was there, and if they wanted to bring down the United States of America, all they would have to do is find the evidence in a database, make it public, and bang, the United States of America would be in one hell of a crisis because the public would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had been lied to, whether it be... Oh, I don't think it's even... I think it's way even beyond that. I mean, I can't imagine that there's a major government on the planet that wouldn't know about it. So, you know, I take all that stuff with a grain of salt mm -hmm. until I actually see it. But right. in my case, I've seen Bigfoot three times. What did he... Swamp Ape. What did I he... prefer to call the one that I see down here yeah. and over in the, the big thicket in Texas. So I can't deny what I've seen. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I know what it takes as a scientist and trained as one uh, to prove that it exists. Have you ever taken a photo of it? <laughs> no, because by the time you see them, they're gone. Really? So, you know, even with a digital camera, which mm -hmm. takes a couple of seconds to pull up, turn on, and charge up, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't have enough time to get a photo. Wow. I mean, even with cell phones, it's difficult. You still got to call up the program. You still got to you know, snap the picture. You still got to get your thumb out of the way because you're, in, you're so excited so that you don't get a picture of your, of your, dermal, your own dermal ridge sure. as much as the animal. It's not so simple. But there are there are webcams you can actually clip onto a hat that remain yeah. on that have, you know, uh, the ability well, to record for five or the six hours. GoPro, I suspect we're going to have some things pretty soon. But they'll still be disputed until they produce a body or some irrefutable DNA. And and why do you think there hasn't been a body recovered yet? I'm not so sure there hasn't been. There's many stories that uh, indicate that, that has been the case, but mm -hmm. they've disappeared. We know for a fact now that giant skeletons have been found all over the world. I defy you to point to one in any of the museums. I haven't and seen one. Get close to one. I know this per firsthand because I've attempted to do it. Mm -hmm. I knew a museum where they were, and I had asked for permission to go in right. to the museum and, uh, and, and extract a tooth to do DNA on it. Mm -hmm. But when I made arrangements to do so, I got a call from the government saying, you can't do this. We're not going to let you. It's part of the Native American Repatriation Act, and it's you know, uh, not allowed. And the skeletal remains have subsequently disappeared. Scott, stand by. We've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, Scott Marlowe is our guest this hour. He's got a new book out, Squallies. And uh, Scott's information and much more can be found at pangeainstitute.us. That's www.pangeainstitute.us. US. We'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. 
Don't forget Exxon Nation starting May the 16th. The Exxon is being moved to 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then the 6 to 10 show is repeated in its entirety from 1 until 5 on the Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and across the European continent on the Digital Satellite Network. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried. He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Daggeronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Donation. We're talking to Scott Marlowe, and uh, Scott has a new book out called Squallies. Uh, where's the book available, Scotty? Uh, well, of course, on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble online, uh, and there's a number of different bookstores that are stocking it now. Uh, I, I, two of them here in Florida I know of is Copperfish Books down in Punta Gorda mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Downtown Books in Pearl in Apalachicola. 
The research center that that you show in your book on page 17, uh, the Yerkes Laboratory in Orange Park, Florida. Yerkes. Yerkes. That's that's an old picture. They're no longer in in the Jacksonville area. They were at the time of the story. Mm -hmm. But they're now uh, located up on the Emory University campus in uh, Atlanta. And on page 46, you have a photograph of... uh, the, de- the descendants of those first squally people who supposedly still live hidden in the backwoods of Big Cypress Swamp. Theoretically, yes. Wow. It does look like Planet of the Apes. It really, I mean, the whole story is very Planet of the Apes. I might, you know, it'd be interesting if they wind up taking over, uh, you know, in the future. But, uh, you know, we won't be here to find out, so I'm not particularly worried about it. How can we go about finding out more about the Squallies? Uh, would it take an expedition? Would it take getting the government to open up their their files about the Squallies? Um, how well, do we... it would be nice. I mean, you, you can try, as I did, mm-hmm. to uh, do a, 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 a Freedom of Information Act piece, and uh, you know, but you're not going to get anything. Uh, and even if you do, it's probably going to be completely blacked out. But there are local stories, and there are people who have had encounters you just have to do some digging. So I recommend you spend a little time in the Naples, Florida area and get over uh, to the, the, the area around, unfortunately, Monroe Station, which figures prominently in the uh, story. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting in terms of the timing. But uh, Monroe Station, just as the book came out, burned to the ground. Coincidence? Uh, I wonder. Hmm. So... How would they make these little guys, who are just a little bit bigger than a chimpanzee, as as we discussed before, into super soldiers or to slaves? Like, what was the reasoning behind it? Well, that was the intention, is to create a slave race that was stronger than humans, would do what they're told, but had some level of intelligence, and that they could train them and use them as soldiers. Did they really think that they would be able to succeed with such a program? Well, put yourself in that, in that time frame's frame of mind. They didn't have the capability of automation as we do now. Mm-hmm. And aren't we, in fact, creating machine drones to do war for us now that are actually, I mean, if you listen to some of the science fiction writers, that's our new slave race? Y- yeah, we are creating an, uh, you know, uh, robots. We are creating drones and so on. But we're not, to my knowledge, creating another race of biological entities. Sure. I mean, and Isaac Asimov would disagree with you. You read iRobot. Yeah, well, of course, that's science fiction. Yeah, but so is this in a way, Uh, although it could be science fiction come true. And in in a very short order, iRobot will be true. Look at look at the developments in in AI technology right now. Mm-hmm. Where does where does AI cross the line? Is there a point where AI should be stopped? Well, yeah, when it uh, starts becoming conscious of itself and realizing its capability and power, considering what you can do with networking computers, mm-hmm. if they all started working together and became sentient, we'd be in trouble. So why are we allowed, or why are we allowing this to continue to grow instead of nipping it in the bud? Uh, well, you'd have to ask the scientists that story. Like, don't they have better things to do with their time? Like, you know, getting rid of global warming, feeding the hungry, taking well, care of the sick. Ideally, ideally, yes, Rob. But you know, humans are weird creatures. We like to walk along the edge of a chasm mm-hmm. and hope we don't fall in. And many people get a very strange thrill at the potential for death, but not actually dying. Yeah, it's it's, it's strange. I'm not planning to go to the edge of the canyon and jump off, but that's me. Other people would do it, and they call it bungee jump. True, true. Or parachuting. Or any number of other you know, death wish sports. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the size of the chimpanzees, you know, and like, you know, like I, I don't understand the rationale behind it. Like, how are you going to train a, a chimpanzee to be a warrior? 
well, how do we train a chimpanzee or gorilla to use sign language? I, I don't see How it. do we train them to do simple tricks in circuses? Well, I've got a dog that can do simple tricks too, but I couldn't see my dog going to war. Yeah, but your dog isn't crossbred with a human and having relatively close to human intelligence. I mean, but, you know, he'll have the tele- intelligence of a seventh grader. All right, but if if these squallies were actually being trained, wouldn't there be evidence of their existence, whether in Germany, whether in Russia, whether anywhere else on the planet? I would think so. But all we have are written documents certifying that these types of experiments were going on. And how do we know these are true documents? Well, we don't. We, we know that the documents are authentic, but the, mm-hmm. the results are equivocal. You know, theoretically, chimps and humans cannot mate. Cannot You cannot have a hybrid because of the differences in chrom- chromosomes. But, you know, here you have a Cornell professor mm-hmm. who, you know, you mentioned the introduction, uh, that's giving a presentation to graduate students and absolutely saying, yes, it happened. I don't know if I can believe it. I don't know if I can. I can't find that particular proof. But the fact that every piece of the story fits is what bothers me. Or should I say nags at me. Yeah. What kind of feedback are you getting? It's been universally positive. I mean, I've had only one person who has misinterpreted uh, this and got in touch with me on Facebook suggesting that they're some sort of pig man, uh, but that's only because of the facial resemblance. Uh, if you do a little digging, it, they're not, of course, uh, crossbred pigs, mm-hmm. as some people are claiming. It's just their face, in the case of some of them, looks very pig-like. So it's, you know, I, I just don't know what to think. It is a perplexing uh, situation, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and there must be something going on because the Chinese experimenting with this is even more recent than our doing so and the Russians doing so. So somebody somewhere must think, and of course in today's world with mm-hmm. the genetics being fairly close and way more advanced, it may be possible today. Then is it possible that a lot of these so-called extraterrestrials are actually hybrids created here on Earth? Well, isn't it possible that humans are a hybrid? Read the story coming out of the Assyrians about the Anunnaki. Well, I don't know how credible that is. Well, I don't know that it isn't. I'm the kind of guy who likes proof. Well, I agree with you, but one of you know, let me let me ask you this. Sure. If you wanted wanted to do clone or make a human being from another human being mm-hmm. without the conventional method, right? What bones do you go to? in order to extract the marrow, which is the best source of the DNA. The thigh. The hip, which you can't do without, or a rib. You can can extract DNA from practically any bone, couldn't you? You don't need the marrow. Theoretically, yes. And, of course, with the amplification process, now yes. Right. But is it going to be 100% pure DNA? You know, degrades very quickly, so it's probably better to use the bones that I just mentioned, and those are the ones that people typically go to, unless you're doing something forensic on a mummy. Mm-hmm. But even then, uh, on the most recent mummy, uh, unknown mummies, they tried to identify the first bones they went to were the hips. Okay, so what you're and saying, DNA so what you're what you're pointing at, what, bone. so what you're pointing at is the story of Adam and Eve. Exactly. You know, is there a, is there a grain of truth in the myth? I know not. And neither do I. I and neither that... does anybody else. We weren't there. So, could the Anunnaki story have some merit? Oh, absolutely. But so many people believe in Santa Claus as well, and we know he doesn't exist. He doesn't fly around in a, uh, in a but sleigh. Again, is based on is based on a person who actually lived. Right, but he still doesn't exist. And how many kids swear Christmas Eve that they've seen Santa Claus and the eight reindeer in the sky? 
Well, I understand that. The reindeer in the sky is a problem, but then again, Daddy dressed in a Santa Claus suit could be mistaken for the real thing. So True. There, you know, that parallel there is obviously Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't anybody found the body of Bigfoot, dragged it to a media center, dropped it on the front door so that it could not be denied so it can't be taken away. It can't be it covered be great. up. It would be great. It would be great, and it would solve the problem. Yeah. But there are stories out there where Bigfoot, and then that's in quotes, mm -hmm. has been discovered. The story of Zena, which we've talked about before, yeah. coming out of the Republic of Georgia mm -hmm. in the 19th century, you, which was a living creature that appears to have been a Bigfoot, uh, there's a story that the KGB released about them capturing a Bigfoot creature in the same general area Zena lived in mm -hmm. uh, during World War II that they thought was a, a, a resistance fighter or what have you, and they locked it up and stank to hell. And they, they you know, and uh, according to one version of the story, it was later executed as a deserter, and in another they let it go. So you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's stories of the Chinese finding the Yirin, which is their version of Bigfoot. Uh, and you know, a body of Ethereum. But, uh, you know, again, the bodies just keep disappearing. Is there a reason? I don't know. Are the governments behind it? Probably, but I don't know. Well, you know, you know like, why can't we find these giant skeletons that people keep coming up with? How can people keep coming up with them if they can't be found? That, well, the point is they come up with them, but shortly after they come up with them, they disappear. Is it possible they've never been found in the first place? Uh, I don't think so. Not when you've got over 300 and some odd stories from disparate uh, places on the planet. Mm -hmm. 300 and some at least here in the United States since the late 1700s. And, I mean, communications as they were back then is not like it is today. So why have they all disappeared? Why have it why they'd all be at the Smithsonian, but the Smithsonian mm -hmm. denies vehemently that they have any of these things. And yet, here's one. I have a friend, uh, an associate, who mm -hmm. interned at the Smithsonian. Right. Actually countered the skeletons in their ossuary. I even had a bin number. And I called to ask about it at their anthropology department and was told categorically the bin number was invalid and that didn't exist. And I and I know this person. They would not lie to me. What different? What would be the significance of finding a Bigfoot? How would that change our world? That would depend on what the Bigfoot actually is. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's an undiscovered animal, I don't think it would change things that drastically. Right. But if it's a relic hominin. In other words, an ancient kind of man, it would probably throw the religious people into an uproar. Okay, so how would an ancient relative of man exist so long without being discovered? I don't know. Now, there are places on the planet that are not widely explored, mm -hmm. like certain mastiffs up in the Himalayas and, and places that are extremely remote where populations could exist in small quantities. I mean, at one time, human beings as we are were down to just a few thousand on the planet due to natural uh, pressures on the population. Talk to the geneticists. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll confirm that. Talk to Todd Discotel. New York. He'll tell you about it. And yet, out of those few thousands that survived on the planet, look at mm -hmm. the billions we have here now. Oh, free love. What can I say? But still, when it comes to Bigfoot, we're in a highly technological era. We, yes. have, we have satellite imagery. We have infrared. We have heat-seeking. We have full-spectrum. We have every type of camera available. Understood. And, you know, you see carcasses of deer on the road, bear on the road, moose on the road. You name it, you see it. And yet, no Bigfoot. Not yet. 
And you haven't uh, the I, to my knowledge, there have been no reports of by law enforcement or U.S. forestry agents of the cadaver of a Bigfoot ever being found. Yes, there are. Did they take pictures? No. The evidence disappeared. There's several accounts of people hitting swamp apes with either a truck or a car here in Florida. And the animal was apparently injured and ran off into the woods, more than likely died. Right. But they either could not find the carcass after the animal was struck, or they did, and the carcass disappeared. What about trace evidence of an accident on the vehicle itself? And, and I've tried that. I have a friend who works at that State Farm, mm -hmm. and that was one of the insurance agencies involved in one of these wrecks down right. in South Florida. And I asked him to go hunting in the archives and uh, see if he could find the, the sample kit because there was blood and what have you on the, uh, on the you know, that was taken at the scene. Right. And... Uh, he quickly lost contact with me, and we haven't had any communication since. Wow. You and I have to take our final break, Scott. Exonation uh, Squallies is the new book out by Scott Marlowe. As Scott said earlier, it's available on Amazon and uh, the all the regular online stores. And uh, for more information on Scott and the Pangea Institute, visit their website at www.pangeainstitute.us. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, Scott Marlowe, and I will be back on the other side of this break to wrap up this hour discussing squallies and Bigfoot. Send me your emails. Tell me what you think. Are you a believer or are you a skeptic? Exxon at exxonradiotv.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, 
opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. From Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Scott Marlowe is our very special guest. And uh, Scott, as always, great having you and, on the show, as well as any of the other members of the Pangea Institute. You guys are certainly an asset to this field that is so perplexing. And uh, Scott, let our listeners know how they can find out more about you and contact you. Well, I mean, obviously the website and my email, is a, there's a link there. And I, I'm not going to broadcast that because I'll wind up with junk mail up to Yang Yang. But uh, in, in any event, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on LinkedIn. You can always find me there, too. Um, you know, with, with all, the, all the work that you've done in researching this, how do you take other Bigfoot researchers? Uh, for example, Gimlin with his, uh, the Patterson-Gimlin film. What is your take on that? Well, I I sit on the fence because I just can't tell for certain, and I I have not seen a first generation version of the film. I've seen clarified images, but mm-hmm. they've been doctored, really, uh, by the clarification process. Oh, so I'm not a hundred percent certain. I would love to see a first generation print of the film, yeah. and uh, you know, be able to ex- express an opinion on that, as opposed to anything that's been enhanced in any way. Uh, of course, you know that was on the old style celluloid, I believe. So, yes. you know, I, I doubt that it's going to be in great shape if it's been locked up in a in a safe somewhere. And but, there are people who have some pretty convincing evidence that it was a fraud, mm-hmm. and there well, are others who have some extremely convincing evidence that it wasn't. So, uh, you know, credibility is an issue with me. I'm not going to pronounce it one way or another. All right, let me ask you this then. You and I have been talking. This, this hour about evidence, about proof, how cadavers disappear, how evidence in an insurance uh, company, you know, has, has disappeared, how a bin number from uh, the Smithsonian disappeared. How come this film hasn't disappeared and is still around? Well, probably because it was released on the Today or the Tonight Show years ago. I think it was. Uh, if it wasn't The Tonight Show, mm-hmm. it was Letterman or something like that. But in any event, in 1967, as I recall, the date and uh, or the, the time frame. And uh, it's a little hard to, with all the millions of people who have seen it, to deny that it's there. So the best way to deal with it, just like with the UFOs and some of the great films of, of UFOs that are hard to explain, uh, the best way to do it is disinformation. Doesn't the government have better things to do than to have a conspiracy about the assassination of JFK, a conspiracy about 9-11, a conspiracy about uh, UFOs, conspiracy about Bigfoot? Like, don't they have better things to do with their time? Well, I would think so. I mean, you're a member of media. You know, I have written for media. Sure. So, I mean, you know, to, that, so you, you have to go where the ratings are. But, uh, you know, there's going to be a conspiracy theory on anything and everything that happens. I mean, my God, there's conspiracy theories all over the place now on prints. Why don't we just wait until we get the coroner's report before we speculate? The question well, is, the do we... Gonna wait. The, the question, cycle doesn't work that way. The question is, why do we need to know? Well, is it any of our business is a good question. Yeah, yes, exactly. Exactly. Scott, as always, time goes by so fast when you're with us, my good friend. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show again. And uh, once again, congratulations on Squallies. And you know what? I've, I've got a feeling it is going to be the success that you know it's going to be. Well, I certainly hope so. And I thank you for having me on and talking about it tonight. I'm pleased to do so at any time. Scott, take care of yourself. And please give my very best to the other members of the Pangea Institute. I will do that. Good night, Take Scott. Care. You too, buddy. Exonation, my guest has been Scott Marlowe. Um, he is with the Pangea Institute, www.pangeainstitute.com.
Us. They're a great bunch of people, hardworking, dedicated, and they're square shooters. Love having them on. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton. Don't go away. <laughs> 